Hello, this video is about the electrophysiological diagnosis of the peroneal nerve from the cycle of lectures on electroneuromyography. My name is Dmitry Sergeyevich Druzinin. The peroneal nerve, unlike the tibial nerve and the sciatic nerve, has several anatomical features. The first feature is that this nerve is fixed in two points. The first fixation point is the level of the sciatic nerve's departure, and the second point is the level of the head of the fibula. As a result, the nerve can be stretched in various types of injuries to the lower limbs. The most typical traction injury being injuries from snowboards, skateboards, and other sports where a person falls with the foot turning inward, often accompanied by fractures of the fibula and traction injury to the peroneal nerve. Traction means damage from stretching, as the nerve is fixed in two points. It can be stretched in these points, and the stretching can be very intense. This can lead to intramural rupture or the formation of a so-called spiral traction scar within this damage, which ultimately seriously disrupts the function of the anterior lateral group of muscles of the leg and foot. The clinical picture associated with peroneal nerve damage is paralysis of the extensor muscles of the foot. This is usually accompanied by a type of gait, where a person walks with a slapping foot. This is due to the lack of active contraction of these muscles, which prevents the lifting of the foot during walking and the foot slaps during walking. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we observed an increase in the number of patients with compressive ischemic neuropathy of the peroneal nerve. This was due to the fact that people were forced to spend a lot of time at the computer working online. This often led to the fact that they spent a long time in an uncomfortable position with one leg crossed over the other. This resulted in the peroneal nerve being compromised at the level of the head of the fibula, leading to compressive ischemic neuropathy. The second feature of the peroneal nerve is its passage through the area of the intertarsal syndesmosis. This is a unique place because under strong internal load rotations of the foot, there may form intraneural and intraneural cysts from the intertarsal syndesmosis, which lead to compression of the peroneal nerve. If a cyst has formed there, it is usually considered a fairly severe damage that leads to a persistent disruption of the function of the muscles of the foot. These two features allow clinicians and neurophysiologists to distinguish this nerve as a special category. Electrophysiological diagnosis is based on the performance of stimulation electromyography of motor and sensory fibers. Motor fibers are a common test, but this test has several nuances. The nuances are that the short muscle extensor digitorum brevis can have a variable location, which can be due to orthopedic pathology. For example, the presence of flat foot can lead to the fact that the muscle may have excessive stretching or have functional hypotrophy. All this can lead to a false belief that the peroneal nerve is damaged. However, more often than not, such types of flat valgus deformations of the feet do not suffer. Only the muscle suffers, but the neurophysiologist during the examinations receives a changed amplitude parameter. And this often confuses neurophysiologists and clinicians about the fact that the nerve is also damaged. The peroneal nerve begins at the level of L4, L5, which is one of the most vulnerable zones in the lumbar spine. Often with sequestrated hernias or other degenerative stenosis of the spinal canal, an artificial decrease in the amplitude of the motor response during stimulation of the peroneal nerve may occur. It is very important to understand that this is not a specific parameter. To diagnose radiculopathy, we will perform needle electromyography. The key muscles will be the tibialis anterior muscle and the extensor hallucis longus for L4, L5 and the gastrocnemius muscle, the calf muscle for the L5-S1 level. Stimulation electroneuromyography of the peroneal nerve can be deceptive since a decrease in the amplitude of the motor response by no means indicates possible radiculopathy. Unfortunately, we often encounter a situation where a neurophysiologist erroneously interprets these data in favor of radiculopathy which often leads to not quite correct planning of the research plan, and in some cases, even planning of unjustified surgical interventions. In this regard, it is important to correctly interpret and correctly perform this study. Now we will consider the possibility of obtaining a different shape of the amplitude of the motor response, depending on the displacement of the electrodes of the motor point. Peroneal nerve innervates the muscle extensor digitorum brevis at the level of the foot, a short muscle that extends the fingers. It can be well determined by palpation as a muscle belly on the dorsum of the foot, and it is on this muscle that we place the electrodes during the standard stimulation electroneuromyography of the peroneal nerve. The grounding electrode is placed at the level of the ankle. This will be the optimal location for the grounding electrode as it will comply with the rules that the grounding electrode is located between the cathode and the active electrode. Its main purpose is to eliminate the artifact from the stimulus. We connect the grounding electrode. Active electrodes are placed on the muscle belly of the extensor digitorum brevis muscle. 
The reference electrode is placed on the tendon at the base of the metatarsal bones 5 and 4. We connect the electrodes, a black active electrode to the muscle belly and a red reference electrode to the tendon. The first point of stimulation for the peroneal nerve will be located above the level of the ankle joint, approximately 2 cm above the dorsum of the ankle. We moisten the electrodes with water for better contact. We set the current strength at about 20 milliamps and begin stimulation to find the supermaximal current strength. So, I apply the first stimulus and get an amplitude of 2.4 millivolts. I increase to 30. And the amplitude is already 4.3 millivolts. I add up to 40 milliamps. The current strength does not increase. Therefore, the supermaximal current strength will be about 30 milliamps. I increase even more to 35 and this will be the supermaximal current strength. Often, there are situations when the peroneal nerve has a very low amplitude within 2.5 or even 1.5 millivolts. Often creating an illusion that there is some electrophysiological deviation from the norm and misleading the neurophysiologist on a false trail of possible neuropathy, in particular axonal neuropathy. Let's consider with you the situations when we can check the possible physical causes of such a low amplitude. The first most common reason is that the muscle belly may be flattened and even by shifting the electrode lower, closer to the base of the foot, we can obtain a different amplitude. Let's check. The first amplitude we received was 4.3 millivolts. Let's try to shift the electrode lower and stimulate again at the supermaximal current strength. The amplitude is already 3 millivolts. This indicates that we shifted to the wrong point. Let's try to shift it a little higher. Let's repeat the stimulation. Amplitude is 2.9, even less. Therefore, initially, I was exactly on the motor point at the level of the extensor digitorum bravus muscle belly. Let's double check. Yes, the amplitude is 4 millivolts. Therefore, the motor point is located precisely in this part. The second most common reason why the amplitude may be lower is the presence of additional anastomoses and additional anomalies. To check this, you can stimulate the peroneal nerve directly under the lateral malleolus. I'll try to stimulate, reducing the current strength to about 25 milliampers. I'll conduct a stimulus. Here, I have an artifact from the current flowing to the ground. So I'll move the grounding electrode a little to the side. I'll repeat the stimulation directly under the ankle, trying to get an amplitude. In this case, I don't have a evoked response, which means that there is no anastomosis. It is not constant. It occurs in about a quarter of cases. It has no clinical significance. But the electrophysiological amplitude can be noticeably lower in patients with an anastomosis. Next, we move on to the second point of stimulation. We find the head of the fibula here. And inserting the electrode under the head of the fibula, we conduct stimulation at the supermaximal current strength of 38 milliampers. We stimulate, we get a good amplitude. Note that the amplitude is 4.5 millivolts, that is more than the amplitude of the distal point. However, this is logical since the nerve is quite superficial and quite constant here. At the same time, its course and trajectory on the level of the dorsum of the foot can differ more laterally or more medially. Therefore, it is much more difficult to stimulate the nerve here. In some guidelines, you can encounter such a situation that you can start stimulation directly from the head of the fibula. Thus, you will immediately get a constant, well-reproducible response with the maximum possible amplitude. Moreover, it will be easier for you to understand what amplitude will be in the distal point. We have stimulated the second point. Let us remember it, marking it with a small point at the level where we conducted the stimulation. 
Next, we go a little lower, closer to the popliteal fossa, and conduct stimulation directly along the path of the peroneal nerve. Since the nerve is located deeper here, I will increase the current strength. I will save this response, increase the current strength, and conduct another stimulation. And I didn't quite hit the nerve, so I got a somewhat low amplitude of 1.4 millivolts. Let's try to move a little and stimulate again. We get an amplitude of 5.4. Therefore, we could have understimulated the nerve in the first two points. Let us double check ourselves again and stimulate the peroneal nerve directly at the level of the ankle at a slightly higher current strength and moving the electrode a little medially. The amplitude is 4.7. This is higher than the 4.3 I initially received. To sort the curves in the right order, we will use the sorting latency function. For this, I will delete the first response, which, in my opinion, is not quite successful. I will go to the Curves tab and select the Sort by Latency option. Thus, the curve with the minimum latency will be located in the first place and the curves with a longer latency will be located in the corresponding second and third places. Next, I will need to determine that this is the tarsus and enter the correct distance. We measure the distance from the level of the active electrode to the cathode. It is 8 centimeters. Next, we will measure the distance from the level of the first point to the second, which is 33 centimeters. and accordingly the distance between the third and second point is 90 centimeters. We got quite good amplitude indicators, more than 3 millivolts. We got the same conduction velocity of excitation at the level of the fibular canal and at the legs. Thus, we do not observe signs of demyelination at the level of the fibular canal and we conclude that the conductive function of the peroneal nerve is normal. Thank you for your attention.